This is the presentation of results of a systems biology model of the corona epidemics. The presentation comes to you from uh, Alexei Golotkin and Hans Westerhoff, who is speaking with some assistance from Samrina Rehman. The network model that we made works on the total population, say, of a country, which may be tested and found to be naive, that is, not infected. They may also be infected by the virus and they may not yet been, have been tested or, and therefore appear to be negative, uh, or they may have been tested and found to be positive. The, these people that are infected may also have developed symptoms but not still be tested, so they are seen as negative, although they have simple symptoms, but then there may be an enhanced rate of testing. So they may turn into people that have symptoms but uh, have been tested positively. Now when they have tested positively and have developed symptoms, they may die from the disease or recover, hopefully. When people are, have, are symptomatic but not tested, they may also recover or uh, suffer from the uh, epidemic and also when they're infected and not yet tested they may also die from the coronavirus uh, as such. They may also be tested positively and there is this development here. Now important in this is the infection coefficient which gives the probability that you're actually infected when you have not yet been infected whether you're tested or not and that is a function of the other people in the population, of course. When there's lots of people that have not been tested but have been infected, and even if they're symptomatic and have not been yet been tested, then you may not know that they have been infected. And therefore you get close to them, and therefore you have a high rate of infection. When they have been tested positively, uh, with or without symptoms, you know that they have been infected, there's a sort of a quarantining and therefore the infection coefficient, the chance that as a naive person you're infected by those, is a lot lower. So that has gone into this model, but you can see it's already quite complicated, so it's very hard to make predictions on the basis of this scheme. We put this into a computer and we ask the computer to calculate the dynamics of the epidemic. And that's what you see here, the number of infected people plotted here as a function of the time in days. This is approximately a year. And we've done that for the unmanaged epidemic. That's in red. And you see that the unmanaged epidemic, almost very soon after the first cases appear, you see an enormous increase. And that's what we've witnessed, of course, on the planet, uh, in, in China and in other countries, an enormous increase of the number of infected people. The epidemic goes full, string, full swing and then dies down, and after three months the epidemics would subside, the unmanaged epidemic. On a strong lockdown, when there's a strong lockdown, like China it is, you see that the epidemic will start to increase but then dies down. It is killed by the strong lockdowns measures. And that remains so until very long in time, until after a year and longer. When you engage in an intermediate soft lockdown, what you will see is that the epidemic will, won't increase that strongly, but will still increase and only die down much later. Uh, and the increase will continue and this will take uh, about 200 days, about uh, uh, half a year, before the epidemic starts to dock down, to die down. And that's a lockdown where social activities are reduced by a factor of two and a half. Now that's the implications for the epidemics. What's the implications for the humans in the country that we're looking at? Well, the unmanaged epidemic may be over quickly, but it's not a good idea because about 3% of the population may actually die from the disease. The complete lockdown, uh, there also the, the epidemic is over soon, but then uh, the number of people dying from it is very low. So that would seem that this complete lockdown in terms of death is a much better strategy. 
the soft or intermediate lockdown may look better because social economic activities are not disturbed so much, but in terms of the number of people dying, it actually helps a bit in, compared with the unmanaged epidemic. But is this acceptable? Because by the end of the year, still half a percent of the population might die from that soft lockdown. So that is the issue we have in place. But note also that paradoxically, the soft lockdown seems to work, but it has this effect that the epidemic lasts a lot longer, both in the unmanaged case and in the strong unmanaged case. And in the strong lockdown case, you see that the epidemic is over in three months. And in the lo uh, soft lockdown case, it takes uh, two thirds of a year. And that's what we've looked here at more in detail, this is the social distancing factor. Strong lockdown, the social distancing factor would be 10, well, that's what we assumed. For no government action, the social distancing factor would be one and remain one. And with the soft lockdown we simulated, then this would be two and a half. And you recognize that with two and a half, the percentage decreased would already be, deceased would already be low. With unmanaged epidemic, that percentage would be three. And with a highly managed and strong lockdown, the percentage would be very low. But the important point of this slide is this time of half onset, defined as shown here. This is the epidemic, this is the time of half onset. onset. That's about the measure of the duration of the epidemic. You see that there is a maximum here. A very hard, uh, sorry, no government policy, no lockdown at all. The epidemic is over very soon. What is it? Uh, this is in terms of years, so this is about two months. Uh, at a high, strong lockdown, it is even over within one month, the epidemic. But if you have this intermediate lockdown, here at 2.3, a factor of 2.3 increase in social distancing, the epidemic would have a time of half onset of about uh, eight months. And at two and a half, this would be about three or four months. That's what you already saw here. So. There is this paradoxical effect, perhaps, that if you change the, the social distancing factor, then there is, you should not sort of end up at a soft social distancing factor, say of about 2.2 or 2.5, because then the epidemic would take a long time. That would be disadvantages from disadvantageous from that point of view. So better, you may not want to have a social distancing factor of 10, a complete lockdown, but it should be a hard lockdown so that you're approximately here, so that the epidemic dies down soon. And you still have the benefit of a low percentage of people dying from the epidemic. So it pays off to have the social distancing larger than the threshold, which is 2.2 here, and so it should be about three or four, this increase in social distancing. Now you may think that intermittent lockdown might also work. If you don't lock down all days of the week, but say uh, uh, three and a half days per week or four days per week, that's 40, 55% of the time, it may also work. Well, it won't. You see that still the epidemic becomes very strong Look at the axis here, 1.5, and the percentage of people of the population deceased would become still 1.3, not 3, but still fairly high. So it might not seem a good idea to have an intermittent lockdown only a few days of the week. But if that number of days in the week is like 5 out of 7, like 70%, then it would work still. You would get a die down of the epidemics in terms of uh, newly tested as infected. And the percentage of people that will die from the epidemic may be below 0.01%. So that is indeed very low. So an intermittent lockdown might work, but it should be more than half, certainly more than half and more than two thirds of the time that should be locked down. So it should be more like five times a week lockdown and two weeks at work. Now, what we found actually, that there is a, maybe an even better idea, a strong lockdown at first and then relax this. So what you should do is measure very well the number of people tested positive each day. At the beginning of the epidemic, you do a strong lockdown. You strongly increase this 
uh, social distancing factor, but when you measure that the number of tested positive each day goes down, you also relax the social distancing. You reduce the social distancing maybe from seven in the beginning to three, and ultimately you could relax it to two and a half, the social distancing factor. So this is the adaptive lockdown. You adapt the social distancing to the development of the epidemic, basically, to the number of tested people tested positive each day. That's the adaptation of the social distancing. But first strong, then you watch the number, the, the epidemic, and then when the epidemic dies, it begins to die down, you relax the social distancing a little bit. That has the advantage of a very low number of deceased people. You would see that the number of deceased people would, and that's what we don't show in this plot, would increase with time. So after a year, the number of deceased people would be low, like 0.1 or 0.01%, depending on what you do precisely. It would be fairly low, but it would be substantial. But by that time, you would hope that the vaccine or other uh, measurements uh, have developed. So this adaptive strategy you see here has the effect that it kills off the epidemics, but it's also robust against infection from abroad. So here we calculated that if at time 200 days you get an infection from abroad, the adaptive strategy would still have the effect that if the epidemics erupts again, you would increase your social distance factor again adaptively, and that would again kill the epidemic. So the advantage of an adaptive, continued adaptive strategy would be that it's robust against infections from it. Now, what in total have been our model outcome? First, it's unfeasible to let the epidemics go and go for herd immunity. That has been proposed or suggested uh, by some people, but it will kill 3% of the population. And that we find unacceptable. And the death toll decreases with increasing lockdown intensity, but not just decreases, it decreases very strongly with increasing lockdown intensity. I think that hasn't been realized. The duration of the epidemic also increases at first with the lockdown intensity. So if you get a stronger lockdown, it lasts longer, the epidemic. But then if you increase it further, the epidemic will last shorter. So you should be below, above that threshold level stronger lockdown than a certain factor, so that the epidemic is short and you have a low number of deaths. Another uh, outcome is that a strong and then soft lockdown is much better than a soft and then strong lockdown. An intermittent lockdown strategy may have, be an idea, and an adaptive lockdown strategy, first strong and then relax the strategy as you are measuring the effect on the epidemic, would be most effective, efficient, and robust, both in terms of locking down the economy and in terms of health. Now, you, the eradication strategy, get rid of the epidemic uh, completely, may indeed be superior, but only if you have the adaptive strategy in place as a backup, because more imports will come from abroad at some point. And although I didn't show that, we've also shown that an early detection of infections is the most effective way before you have vaccines. So we imagine that an adaptive lockdown strategy, first strong, then uh, relaxation, together with emphasis on measure, 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 detection, earlier detection of infections, would be the best way to proceed. Now, you can see that there is these various strategy. And you might think some of them are completely obvious, but apparently not, because different governments have engaged in different strategies. The USA and Brazil have initially said, let's go, let it go. And they went for herd immunity. That was even mentioned in the Netherlands at some point. At the Netherlands and USA and the UK are now doing a soft, then strong lockdown strategy, which is again, as we saw, not the best. A strong and then soft lockdown strategy would be much better. If you engage like in an eradication strategy, that's China, that may actually be superior, as they've shown, but then you have the effect of reinfection from abroad. So you should have an adaptive strategy in place. And of course, they're working on it. Uh, now, Taiwan and South Korea had an adaptive 
lockdown strategy in place and that seems to work. And the World Health Organization is emphasizing earlier detection of infections. So the important point that there is different policies by different governments and they have not, the differences are very, very important on the death goal toll. So press, parliament and public should be critical of these governments because some of them are mistaken and that comes at tremendous cost for the population. And a conclusion is that a strong first and then adaptive strategy with increased testing should be best not only for health but also for the economy of the countries and of the world. So this was an advice that came from computations of a systems biology model of the corona epidemics by Alexei Kolotkin and myself, Hans Westerhoff. Uh, there is more information available in this model and in this paper. And I'd like to thank you for your attention.